Chapter 17. The Cavern. In the evening, Mr. Trelawney took again the whole party into the study. When we were all attention, he began to unfold his plans. I have come to the conclusion that for the proper carrying out of what we will call our great experiment, we must have absolute and complete isolation. Isolation not merely for a day or two, but for as long as we may require. Here, such a thing would be impossible with the needs and habits of a great city, with its ingrained possibilities of interruption, would or might quite upset us. Telegrams, registered letters, or express messengers would alone be sufficient. But the great army of those who want to get something would make disaster certain. In addition, the occurrences of the last week have drawn police attention to this house. Even if special instructions to keep an eye on it have not been issued from Scotland Yard or the district station, you may be sure that the individual policeman on his rounds will keep it well under observation. Besides, the servants who have discharged themselves will before long begin to talk. They must, for they have, for the sake of their own characters, to give some reason for the termination of a service which has, I should say, a position in the neighbourhood. The servants of the neighbours will begin to talk, and perhaps the neighbours themselves. Then the active and intelligent press will, with its usual zeal for the enlightenment of the public, and its eye to the increase of circulation, get hold of the matter. When the reporter is after us, we shall not have much chance of privacy. Even if we were to bar ourselves in, we should not be free from interruption, possibly from intrusion. Either would ruin our plans, and so we must take measures to effect a retreat, carrying all our impedimenta with us. For this I am prepared. For a long time past I have foreseen such a possibility, and have made preparation for it. Of course I had no foreknowledge of what has happened, but I knew something would, or might, happen. For more than two years past, my house in Cornwall has been made ready to receive all the curios which are preserved here. When Corbeck went off on his search for the lamps, I had the old house at Killian made ready. It is fitted with electric light all over, and all the appliances for manufacture of the light are complete. I had perhaps better tell you, for none of you, not even Margaret, knows anything of it, that the house is absolutely shut out from public access, or even from view. It stands on a little rocky promontory behind a steep hill, and except from the sea cannot be seen. Of old it was fenced in by a high stone wall, for the house which it succeeded was built by an ancestor of mine in the days when a great house far away from a centre, had to be prepared to defend itself. Here, then, is a place so well adapted to our needs that it might have been prepared on purpose. I shall explain it to you when we are all there. This will not be long, for already our movement is in train. I have sent word to Marvin to have all preparations for our transport ready. He is to have a special train, which is to run at night so as to avoid notice. Also a number of carts and stone wagons, with sufficient men and appliances to take all our packing cases to Paddington. We shall be away before the Argoside pressman is on the watch. We shall today begin our packing up, and I dare say that by tomorrow night we shall be ready. In the outhouses I have all of the packing cases which were used for bringing the things from Egypt, and I am satisfied that as they were sufficient for the journey across the desert and down the Nile to Alexandria, and thence to London, they will serve without fail between here and Killian. We four men, with Margaret to hand us such things as we may require, will be able to get the things packed safely, and the carrier's men will take them to the trucks. Today the servants go to Killian, and Mrs. Grant will make such arrangements as may be required. She will take a stock of necessities with her, so that we will not attract local attention by our daily needs and will keep us supplied with perishable food from London, thanks to Margaret's wise and generous treatment of the servants who decided to remain. We have got a staff on which to depend. They have been already cautioned to secrecy, so that we need not fear gossip from within. Indeed, 
as the servants will be in London after their preparations at Killian are complete. They will not be much subject for gossip, in detail at any rate. As, however, we should commence the immediate work of packing at once, we will leave over the proceedings to later when we have leisure. Accordingly, we set about our work. Under Mr. Trelawney's guidance, and aided by the servants, we took from the outhouses great packing cases. Some of these were of enormous strength, fortified by many thicknesses of wood, and by iron bands and rods with screw ends and nuts. We placed them throughout the house, each close to the object to which it was contained. When this preliminary work had been effected, and there had been placed in each room and in the hall great masses of new hay, cotton waste and paper, the servants were sent away. Then we set about to packing. No one not accustomed to packing could have the slightest idea of the amount of work involved in such a task as that in which we were engaged. For my own part, I had had a vague idea that there were a large number of Egyptian objects in Mr. Trelawney's house, but until I came to deal with them seriatim, I had little idea of either their importance, the size of some of them, or their endless number. Far into the night we worked. At times we used all of the strength which we could muster on a single object. Again, we worked separately, but always under Mr. Trelawney's immediate direction. He himself, assisted by Margaret, kept an exact tally of each piece. It was only when we sat down, utterly wearied, to a long-delayed supper that we began to realise that a large part of the work was done. Only a few of the packing cases, however, were closed, for a vast amount of work still remained. We had finished some of the cases, each of which held only one of the great sarcophagi. The cases which held many objects could not be closed till all had been differentiated and packed. I slept that night without movement or without dreams, and on our comparing notes in the morning, I found that each of the others had had the same experience. By dinner time next evening, the whole work was complete, and all was ready for the carriers who would come at midnight. A little before the appointed time, we heard the rumble of carts. Then we were shortly invaded by an army of workmen, who seemed by sheer force of numbers to move without effort in an endless procession all our prepared packages. A little over an hour sufficed them, and when the carts had rumbled away, we all got ready to follow them to Paddington. Silvio was, of course, to be taken as one of our party. Before leaving, we went in a body to over the house, which looked desolate indeed. As the servants had all gone to Cornwall, there had been no attempt at tidying up. Every room and passage in which we had worked, and all the stairways, was strewn with paper and waste, and marked with dirty feet. The last thing which Mr. Trelawney did before coming away was to take from the great safe the ruby with the seven stars. As he put it safely into his pocket-book, Margaret, who had all at once seemed to grow deadly tired and stood beside her father pale and rigid, suddenly became all aglow, as though the sight of the jewel had inspired her. She smiled at her father approvingly as she said, You are right, father. There will not be any more trouble tonight. She will not wreck your arrangements for any cause. I would stake my life upon it. She, or something, wrecked us in the desert when we had come from the tomb in the Valley of the Sorcerer, was the grim comment of Corbeck, who was standing by. Margaret answered him like a flash. Ah, she was then near her tomb from which for thousands of years her body had not been moved. She must know that things are different now. How must she know? asked Corbeck keenly. If she has that astral body that father spoke of, surely she must know. How can she fail to, with an invisible presence and an intellect that can roam abroad even to the stars and the worlds beyond us? She paused, and her father said solemnly, It is on that supposition that we are proceeding. We must have the courage of my convictions, and act on them to the last. Margaret took his hand and held it in a dreamy kind of way as we filed out of the house. She was holding it still when he locked the hall door, and when we moved up the road to the gateway whence we took a cab to Paddington.
When all the goods were loaded at the station, the whole of the workmen went on to the train. This took also some of the stone wagons used for carrying the cases with the great sarcophagi. Ordinary carts and plenty of horses were to be found at Westerton, which was our station for Killian. Mr. Trelawney had ordered a sleeping carriage for our party, and as soon as the train had started we all turned into our cubicles. That night I slept sound. There was over me a conviction of security which was absolute and supreme. Margaret's definite announcement, There will not be any trouble tonight, seemed to carry assurance with it. I did not question it, nor did anyone else. It was only afterwards that I began to think as to how she was so sure. The train was a slow one, stopping many times and for considerable intervals. As Mr. Trelawney did not wish to arrive at Westerton before dark, there was no need to hurry, and arrangements had been made to feed the workmen at certain places on the journey. We had our own hamper with us in the private car. All that afternoon we talked over the great experiment, which seemed to have become a definite entity in our thoughts. Mr. Trelawney became more and more enthusiastic as time went on. Hope was with him becoming certainty. Dr. Winchester seemed to become imbued with the sum of his spirit, though at times he would throw out some scientific fact which would either make an impasse to the other's line of argument, or would come as an arresting shock. Mr. Corbeck, on the other hand, seemed slightly antagonistic to the theory. It may have been that whilst the opinions of the others advanced, his own stood still, but the effect was an attitude which appeared negative, if not wholly one of negation. As for Margaret, she seemed to be in some way overcome. Either it was some new phase of feeling with her, or else she was taking the issue more seriously than she had yet done. She was generally more or less distraught, as though sunk in a brown study. From this she would recover herself with a start. This was usually when there occurred some marked episode in the journey, such as stopping at a station or when the thunderous rumble of crossing a viaduct woke the echoes of the hills or cliffs around us. On each such occasion she would plunge into the conversation, taking such a part in it as to show that whatever had been her abstracted thought, her senses had taken in fully all that had gone around her. Towards myself her manner was strange. Sometimes it was marked by a distance, half shy, half haughty, which was new to me. But at other times, there were moments of passion and look and gesture and voice, which almost made me dizzy with delight. Little, however, of a marked nature transpired during the journey. There was but one episode which had in it any element of alarm, but as we were all asleep at the time, it did not disturb us. We only learned it from a communicative guard in the morning. Whilst running between Dawlish and Tainmouth, the train stopped by a warning given by someone who had moved a torch to and fro right on the very track. The driver had found on pulling up that just ahead of the train a small landslip had taken place, some of the red earth from the high bank having fallen away. It did not, however, reach to the metals, and the driver had resumed his way, none too well pleased about the delay. To use his own words, the guard thought there was too much bally caution on this here line. We arrived at Westerton about nine o'clock in the evening. Carts and horses were in waiting, and the work of unloading the train began at once. Our own party did not wait to see the work done, as it was in the hands of competent people. We took the carriage which was in waiting, and through the darkness of the night sped on to Killian. We were all impressed by the house as it appeared in the bright moonlight. A great grey stone mansion of the Jacobian period, Vast and spacious, standing high over the sea on the very verge of a high cliff. When we had swept round the curve of the avenue cut through the rock, and come out on the high plateau on which the house stood, the crash and murmur of waves breaking against rock far below us came with an invigorating breath of moist sea air. We understood then, in an instant, how well we were shut out from the world on that rocky shelf above the sea. Within the house we found all ready. Mrs. Grant and her staff had worked well, and all was bright and fresh and clean. We took a brief survey of the chief rooms, and then separated to have a wash and to change our clothes after our long journey of more than four and twenty hours. 
We had supper in the great dining room on the south side, the walls of which actually hung over the sea. The murmur came up muffled, but never ceased. As the little promontory stood well out into the sea, the northern side of the house was open, and the due north was in no way shut out by the great mass of rock which, reared high above us, shut out the rest of the world. Far off across the bay we could see the trembling lights of the castle, and here and there along the shore of the faint light of a fisher's window. For the rest, the sea was a dark blue plain here and there, a flicker of light as the gleam of starlight fell on the slope of a swelling wave. When supper was over, we all adjourned to the room which Mr. Trelawney had set aside as his study, his bedroom being close to it. As we entered, the first thing I noticed was a great safe, somewhat similar to that which stood in his room in London. When we were in the room, Mr. Trelawney went over to the table and, taking out his pocket book, laid it on the table. As he did so, he pressed down on it with the palm of his hand. A strange pallor came over his face. With fingers that trembled, he opened the book, saying as he did so, Its bulk does not seem the same. I hope nothing has happened. All three of us men crowded round close. Margaret alone remained calm. She stood erect and silent, and still as a statue. She had a far away look in her eyes, as though she did not either know or care what was going on around her. With a despairing gesture, Trelawney threw open the pouch of the pocket book wherein he had placed the jewel of the seven stars. As he sank down on the chair which stood close to him, he said in a hoarse voice, My God, it is gone. Without it, the great experiment can come to nothing. His words seemed to wake Margaret from her introspective mood. An agonized spasm swept her face, but almost on the instant she was calm. She almost smiled as she said, You may have left it in your room, father. Perhaps it has fallen out of the pocketbook whilst you were changing. Without a word, we all hurried into the next room through the open door between the study and the bedroom. And then a sudden calm fell on us like a cloud of fear. There, on the table, lay the jewel of the seven stars, shining and sparkling with lurid light as though each of the seven points of each of the seven stars gleamed through blood. Timidly, we each looked behind us and then at each other. Margaret was now like the rest of us. She had lost her statuesque calm. All of the introspective rigidity had gone from her, and she clasped her hands together till the knuckles were white. Without a word, Mr. Trelawney raised the jewel and hurried with it into the next room. As quietly as he could, he opened the door of the safe with the key fastened to his wrist and placed the jewel within. When the heavy doors were closed and locked, he seemed to breathe more freely. Somehow this episode, though a disturbing one in many ways, seemed to bring us back to our old selves. Since we had left London, we had all been overstrained, and this was a sort of relief. Another step in our strange enterprise had been effected. The change back was more marked in Margaret than in any of us. Perhaps it was that she was a woman whilst we were men. Perhaps it was that she was younger than the rest. Perhaps both reasons were effective each in its own way. At any rate, the change was there, and I was happier than I had been through the long journey. All her buoyancy, her tenderness, her deep feelings seemed to shine forth once more. Now and again, as her father's eyes rested on her, his face seemed to light up. Whilst we waited for the carts to arrive, Mr. Trelawney took us through the house, pointing out and explaining where the objects which we had brought with us were to be placed. In one respect only did he withhold confidence. The positions of all those things which had connection with the great experiment were not indicated. The cases containing them were to be left in the outer hall for the present. By the time we had made the survey, the carts began to arrive and the stir and bustle of the previous night was renewed. Mr. Trelawney stood in the hall beside the massive iron-bound door, and gave directions as to the placing of each of the great packing cases. Those containing many items were placed in the inner hall where they were to be unpacked. In an incredibly short time the whole consignment was delivered, and the men departed with a dossier for each, 
given through their foreman, which made them refusive in their thanks. Then we all went to our own rooms. There was a strange confidence over us all. I do not think that any one of us had a doubt as to the quiet passing of the remainder of the night. The faith was justified, for on our reassembling in the morning we found that all had slept well and peaceably. During that day all the curios, except those required for the great experiment, were put into the places designed for them. Then it was arranged that all the servants should go back with Mrs. Grant to London in the next morning. When they had all gone, Mr. Trelawney, having seen the doors locked, took us into the study. Now, he said when we were seated, I have a secret to impart, but, according to an old promise which does not leave me free, I must ask you each to give me a solemn promise not to reveal it. For three hundred years at least, such a promise has been extracted from everyone to whom it was told, and more than once life and safety were secured through loyal observance of the promise. Even as it is, I am breaking the spirit, if not the letter of the tradition, for I should only tell it to the immediate members of my family. We all gave the promise required. Then he went on, there is a secret place in this house, a cave, natural originally but finished by labour, underneath this house. I will not undertake to say that it has always been used according to the law. During the bloody assize, more than a few Cornishmen found refuge in it, and later and earlier it formed, I have no doubt whatever, a useful place for storing contraband goods. Trey, Paul and Penn, I suppose you know, have always been smugglers, and their relations and friends and neighbours have not held back from the enterprise. For all such reasons, a safe hiding place was always considered a valuable possession. And as the heads of our house have always insisted on preserving the secret, I am honour bound to it. Later on, if all be well, I shall of course tell you, Margaret, and you too, Ross, under the conditions that I am bound to make. He rose up and we all followed him. Leaving us in the outer hall, he went away alone for a few minutes and, returning, beckoned us to follow him. In the inside hall we found a whole section of an outstanding angle moved away and from the cavity saw a great hole dimly dark and the beginning of a rough staircase cut in the rock. As it was not pitch dark, there was manifestly some means of lighting it naturally, so without pause we followed our host as he descended. After some forty or fifty steps cut into a winding passage, we came to a great cave whose further end tapered away into blackness. It was a huge place, dimly lit by a few irregular long slits of eccentric shape. It was a huge place, dimly lit by a few irregular long slits of eccentric shape. Manifestly, these were faults in the rock which would readily allow the windows to be disguised. Close to each of them was a hanging shutter which could be easily swung across by means of a dangling rope. The sound of the ceaseless beat of the waves came up muffled from far below. Mr. Trelawney at once began to speak. This is the spot which I have chosen, and the best I know, for the scene of our great experiment. In a hundred different ways it fulfils the conditions which I am led to believe, are primary with regards to success. Here we are, and shall be, as isolated as Queen Terra herself would have been in her rocky tomb in the Valley of the Sorcerer, and still in a rocky cavern. For good or ill we must here stand by our chances, and abide by results. If we are successful we shall be able to let in on the world of modern science such a flood of light from the old world as will change every condition of thought and experiment and practice. If we fail, then even the knowledge of our attempt will die with us. For this and all else which may come, I believe we are prepared. He paused. No one spoke, but we all bowed our heads gravely in acquiescence. He resumed, but with a certain hesitancy. It is not yet too late. If any of you have a doubt or misgiving, for God's sake, speak it now. Whoever it may be can go hence without let or hindrance. The rest of us can go on our way alone. Again he paused and looked keenly at us in turn. We looked at each other, but no one quailed, 
For my own part, if I had any doubt as to going on, the look on Margaret's face would have reassured me. It was fearless. It was intense. It was full of a divine calm. Mr. Trelawney took a long breath, and in a more cheerful as well as in a more decided tone went on. As we are all of one mind, the sooner we get the necessary matters in train, the better. Let me tell you that this place, like all the rest of the house, could be lit with electricity. We could not join the wires to the mains, lest our secret should become known. But I have a cable here which we can attach to the hall and complete the circuit. As he was speaking, he began to ascend the steps. From close to the entrance, he took the end of a cable. This he drew forward and attached to a switch in the wall. Then, turning on a tap, he flooded the whole vault and staircase below with light. I could now see from the volume of light streaming up into the hallway that the hall beside the staircase went direct into the cave. Above it was a pulley and a mass of strong tackle with multiplying blocks of the Smeaton order. Mr. Trelawney, seeing me looking at this, said, correctly interpreting my thoughts, Yes, it is new. I hung it there myself on purpose. I knew we should have to lower great weights, and as I did not wish to take too many into my confidence, I arranged a tackle which I could work alone if necessary. We set to work at once, and before nightfall had lowered, unhooked and placed in the positions designated for each by Trelawney, all the great sarcophagi and all the curios and other matters which we had taken with us. It was a strange and weird proceeding, the placing of those wonderful monuments of a bygone age in that green cavern, which represented in its cutting and purpose an up-to-date mechanism and electric lights, both the old world and the new. But as time went on, I grew more and more to recognise the wisdom and correctness of Mr. Trelawney's choice. I was much disturbed when Silvio, who had been brought into the cave in the arms of his mistress, and who was lying asleep on my coat which I had taken off, sprang up when the cat mummy had been unpacked, and flew at it with the same ferocity which he had previously exhibited. The incident showed Margaret in a new phase, and one which gave my heart a pang. She had been standing quite still at one side of the cave, leaning on a sarcophagus, in one of those fits of abstraction which had of late come upon her, but on hearing the sound, and seeing Silvio's violent onslaught, she seemed to fall into a positive fury of passion. Her eyes blazed, and her mouth took a hard, cruel tension which was new to me. Instinctively, she stepped towards Silvio as if to interfere in the attack. But I, too, had stepped forward, and as she caught my eye, a strange spasm came upon her, and she stopped. Its intensity made me hold my breath, and I put up my hand to clear my eyes. When I had done this, she had on the instant recovered her calm, and there was a look of brief wonder on her face. With all her old grace and sweetness, she swept over and lifted Silvio, just as she had done on former occasions, and held him in her arms petting him and treating him as though he were a little child who had erred. As I looked, a strange fear came over me. The Margaret that I knew seemed to be changing, and in my inmost heart I prayed that the disturbing cause might soon come to an end. More than ever, I longed at that moment that our terrible experiment should come to a preposterous termination. When all had been arranged in the room as Mr. Trelawney wished, he turned to us, one after another, till he had concentrated the intelligence of us all upon him. Then, he said, All is now ready in this place. We must only await the proper time to begin. We were silent for a while. Dr. Winchester was the first to speak. What is the proper time? Have you any approximation, even if you are not satisfied as to the exact day? He answered at once, After the most anxious thought, I have fixed it on July 31st. May I ask why that date? He spoke his answer slowly. Queen Terra was ruled in great degree by mysticism, and there are so many evidences that she looked for resurrection that naturally she would choose a period ruled over by a god specialised to such a purpose. Now, the fourth month of the season of inundation was ruled by Hermarchus, this being the name for Ra, the sun god, at his rising in the morning. 
and therefore typifying the awakening or arising. This arising is manifestly to physical life, since it is of the midworld of human daily life. Now, as this month begins on our 25th July, the seventh day would be July 31st, for you may be sure that the Mystic Queen would not have chosen any day but the seventh or some power of seven. I dare say that some of you have wondered why our preparations have been so deliberately undertaken. This is why. We must be ready in every possible way when the time comes. But there was no use in having to wait round for such a needless number of days. And so we waited only for the 31st of July, the next day but one, when the great experiment would be made.